any of the others. Right, what we're going to do today, we're going to do the archaeology of mummification. Now, I have presented this to two other classes, and my, my computer wouldn't work because there's no power. So you get the benefits of a wonderful lecture today. So, when, when we... What's that? Exactly. So, when we think about the mummy, I, I really thought, like, we're going to do mummification in Britain as well, right? Yes, we are. Um, and, but when you think about mummies, you think about the mummies of all those legends um, that have been excavated in Egypt. So, a couple of benchmarks we need to start off with. The first benchmark that we're really going to start off with um, is by saying that mummification is not just about wrappings around a human body. It's about bodies that have been naturally mummified by the elements. Yeah? Um, that it's, it's one of those words in English that has altered. Yes. Yes. And unlike the mummies that we find in Central America. So beyond the hype, although the recent discovery um, of, of mummies in Persia, um, which turns out to be false, um, we've got to think of the word mummy actually coming from Persia, but it's a word that managed to get over to Egypt to mummify, mummification. Okay? The proper old-fashioned mummification is where you take everything out through the nose and the guts and all the rest of it and you put it in canopic jars and so on and so on and wrapping. That's the traditional way of mummification. But now, today, and in the text, it's got a broad scope. Okay? The term is now generally applied to all human remains which have retained soft tissues. And when we think about Lindo Man, okay, and Pete Marsh, mummies that have been found in this country, the top soft tissues are all, are all that remains. Because in, in peat bogs, strangely enough, the peat eats away at the, the bone itself, but leaves the soft tissues. Try and get your mind around that. It's difficult to do, okay? Um, it, it's like... It's like the acid um, eating away um, at the body of a car and leaving the fuel behind. You know, that type of weird concept. Uh, mummification can be found in almost every continent. And mummification isn't um, just about deliberate mummification. It's about accidental mummification. And the word mummy is very much synonymous with the land of Egypt. And now, whenever you see headlines in the newspaper you see the body was mummified in a bed for four weeks because nobody visited the old chap okay because it's all dried out and that's the way it is mummification to the art of people in the inca civilization is that the bodies were so dried out that you could carry mum and dad with you anywhere okay and you can communicate with mum and dad forever. Um, carry them from place to place in the panniers on your donkey. At least they don't talk back. Um, the idea of this mummification comes from, and the word mummy and all those ideas about mummies, comes from the wonderful world of Egypt when people were bringing back as tourists they were bringing back the mummies to our land, and then America, and then France, and Germany, and Italy. And everyone would have great delight to show you that they had a mummy in their living room. And you would have mummy unwrapping parties. It's true. I have asked this next question of all those that I've presented this talk to. Have any of you ever seen, very relevant, the film Texas Chainsaw Massacre? No? Yeah. You're the only one. <laughs> um, I have seen bits of that film, Texas Chainsaw Mat Massacre, because I couldn't cope with it, right? And there was one scene I saw that he'd mummified all his relatives, right? That they had all died of old age, but one or two of them were still alive 
is called living mummification. It does occur today, where somebody would be given um, pine resin and their bad body would gradually mummify whilst their brain and heart are still beating and everything slowly slows down, but they're still able to suck blood in the case of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Remember that scene? Yeah, we're not going there, right? Uh, because that's why he did it, wasn't it? Um, for fresh blood. Um, but living mummification, that's something else, okay? And now I've mentioned it, I've got to explain what living mummification is about. It's not wrappings of people. It's not people who have been accidentally found, like Otzi the Iceman, and people in Antarctica, um, and that wonderful explorer that was found at the base of Mount Everest recently, frozen um, as a mummy, okay? Um, we've got to think about living mummification. What is living mummification? It's a very strange one indeed. And why is it so strange? Well, it's quite simple. Um, there are people in China in, and uh, Japan that think of life as a continuance, where you have to preserve the body, and the body continues further beyond the point that your heart and your brain stops working. And there, there, are, there are monks in the Taoist, Buddhist faith, and so on and so on, uh, that um, go on retreat and have a collection of pine nuts and pine resin and various liquidized forms of, of pine and over a few months they would gradually eat the nuts, drink the pine resin, slowly but surely their body would be self-mummified. Their skin and all their organs, their kidney, he doesn't like this, and their heart would be all slowly mummified and gradually the last things to shut down is their beating heart and their brain, at which point they become living mummies. They self-mummify. Somebody asked me, is that suicide? And I says, no, it's not suicide. Do you know anyone that's committed suicide, that's, that's deliberately taken three or four months to do it? No. This, I've had this debate, and I find it really difficult to think that it is suicide. I, I, it's... It, to me, it's on another plane because the people, when when, um, when people um, think about suicide, there's there's no option, right? They feel that there's no option. Okay, I'm not going into detail, but I, I, years ago I, I contemplated it myself uh, because there was no option. I couldn't see a way out, right? But people who self mummify. Um, this is what they're going to do. Well, there's one person that's doing that. Yes. That makes a bloke on the telly. All oh, right. He, he does nature and he's living off the land. That's yeah. His name. Yeah, go on. He's forever drinking pine needle tea. <laughs> so he could be getting something. Yes, exactly. He could be getting something out of it. He could get be getting a high. Anyway, we've got, we've got lots to go through. Carry on. Okay, no? Okay. Uh, in popular fiction, mummies were reduced to little more than bandaged corpses with arms outstretched as they staggered towards some hapless virtue. Um, and we talk about Bram Stoker's Jewel of the Seven Stars. His reanimated Egyptian princess established... Um, an enduring image of the villainous mummy, endlessly um, repeated by Hollywood. And we think about Boris Karloff in the film um, in 1932. <coughs> but all is said, <coughs> sorry, all is said about mummies goes back to ancient Egypt. But we've talked about other forms of mummification already. And did you know that? Back to some of these mummies that we, they were bringing back from ancient Egypt in the early 1800s and by the 1850s and the 1860s. 
They would have mummy and wrapping parties. So the family that's brought back a mummy from Egypt is quite excited. And all their friends are arranged around the central table. Ten, twenty chairs around with the host with a scalpel ready to cut open the bandages. And Michael would bet that there might be earrings on the mummy. Somebody else would bet that it's a female. Somebody else would bet uh, that if they're right, and I'm going to be crude, but that the, um, that the mummy's penis is still intact. And if they are right, they get to take that penis home with them to add to their collection. I am not making this up, right? And, and people, people would put bets on whether there's a necklace and all these other things, right? And there are people on this planet who do have collections of mummified willies. I've got to say it. Um, so there would be the, the, uh, the scaffold down from the, um, the uh, forehead all the way down to the groinal area. And then maybe, oh, we'll forget about the legs. Is there going to be, oh, yeah, you said there might be um, gold rings on the toes. All right, we'll cut this one open, yeah? Okay. Uh, be, because it's either, it's going to be wrapped together or maybe separately wrapped, but this one, the two legs are wrapped together, so we take it all the way down to the toe. And lo and behold, we've got some rings, so you can have them. And by the way, Brian, the, the willy's still intact, so you can have that. Um, you can have it to your collection. It's really nice. That's a nice anniversary of falling me up. He wants to get out of it. Anyway, let's move on. Um, now, this, this next one is a really interesting one. It's talking about a place known as Callum Hallen. Okay? And Callum Hallen, uh, which we're going to be in full there, um, is a, basically uh, looking at some uh, wonderful uh, Bronze Age uh, mummies that were found... Um, on the uh, western coast of Scotland in the Hebridean Islands of Carl Hallen. And what, what, what we do find uh, is that we, we are finding people deliberately mummifying people in Britain and that form of mummification in Britain at Callum Hallen, and there are other examples a very, very interesting forms of mummification, okay? And why are they interesting forms of mummification? Well, um, some of these bodies, what you find when they've analysed them um, and when they dissected the bones and looked at them, they started to find that some of the bodies at Callum Hallen may have had the head and the spinal bones and the ribs of the original person being a male and there's a female arm being added and there's a leg of another male being added and there's a hand from somebody else being added, right? And they started doing the DNA and they started working out that the DNA of all the different bones from that, that body are not only from different individuals they are all from the same family. Okay? And that to me is really interesting. It's really interesting uh, because it puts another take on mummification. When we think about mummification in Egypt, we think about people being placed in a mummy and locked away in a tomb, okay? Like the Bar Boris Karloff tomb, and suddenly you open it up and the mummy comes out, right? Those, those tombs are never to be opened. Okay, they're supposed to be sealed forever. The very tomb of King Tut and the curse associated with it when it was opened um, on those fateful days in November um, 1922. Um, that mummy should have been left there and all the people who were involved were cursed and all those other things. Yeah? The ones at Callum Allen are mummies that are to be kept within the family home over a long period of time. And how that would work? Who wants to die for me today? Go on, John. 
Um, jo John, John has passed away, right? We're all John's family members. We love him to bits, okay? And we love his bits as well, but there's none of that, Brian, okay? So what we're going to do, uh, we're going to nicely clothe the individual, John, over a couple of weeks. He's in the family home. He's dried out. The putre putrefaction's taken place. He smells a little bit. Didn't they coat snow, then? The, they could have. But however we dealt with John, right, you wouldn't have had any whiff off him anyway because it's a round house and there's loads of different smells and so on. And then there's animals in there. So John's nicely mummifying, sitting up on a bench, right? And John can still take part in family discussions, even though he's not able to speak. And every now and again, one of his limbs moves this way and that way, and maybe you've got to put it into position. It's a perfectly mummified cadaver, John is. He's the best cadaver we've ever had. All right? But it's decided by the family that we've got too many mummified people in the uh, main roundhouse, which is living room, kitchen, bedrooms, and all together. And there's, there's several of our relatives. John is the latest. But from now on, as John, John's limbs fall off, the next person in line to pass away will bury most of their body, but we might cut an arm off. One day, I was tapping John's shoulder, and his arm fell off. So, you know, the dog ran off with his arm. And what happens next is Auntie Phyllis dies. Right? So what we do, we cut Auntie Phyllis's arm off and we sews it back to the rest of your body, John. Okay? And the interesting thing is, we really believe this happened at Callum Hallen. Okay? And the only way to express what our ancestors are thinking can be only translated into this following metaphor. My granddad always used to say to me, he always used to say, look, Carl, Whenever you're offered a lift from anyone, right, and you're in a meeting or anything, always be the first to take that lift because you might not be ever offered another lift, right? Didn't take any notice of my granddad. I learned um, that walking home was not a nice thing to do because I'd be too polite. So now if somebody offers me a lift, I'm the first to get it. And the, why is that a metaphor? Because uh, I've got a bit of a problem, uh, John, right? in answering this problem and that's exactly the way what we're doing I'm using memories that I've got with John and how he would work things out so John is a very useful member of the family except some of his stupid suggestions but anyway that's fine that's fine so that that's that's mummification in Britain but it isn't the end of mummification in Britain we'll go through a few of these slides in a minute okay um Oh, that's something else there. Uh, but before before we... There we go. The Callum Hallen site. Yeah, on South Uist. Um, it's, it's mentioned at the top there. But before we go on to this next one... Um, before we go on to this next one... It's mentioning a few things more about the bodies at Callum Hallen. Um, in Britain as well, very recently, um, up in the northeast of uh, England, I think in Durham Way, the archaeologists were excavating away and they found the telltale signs of mummification in the Roman period in Britain. The people were being buried in a mummified style in Britain. They've, they've got evidence of canopic jars, they've got evidence that the wooden coffin itself or the wooden sarcophagi would have actually, uh, they've got evidence of plaster, okay, which would have adorned the outside of the coffin, the coffin lid. And they got evidence of uh, painting on it, 
and they've obviously got um, inside as they excavate they, there's like a there's like a shell around the the skeletal remains indicating that they had been mummified so all the all the bandages have rotted away but that's a form of mummification and that's really interesting because um, obviously people who were from Egypt lived in Britain in the Roman period as part of this wonderful Roman world the wonderful cosmopolitan world of ancient Rome in Britain um, and I'm going to remind you about the kettle again um, so there's there's a um, just your, I think you should because uh, Mike was panicking well it's on the, it's on the cooker it's not we usually, we, we usually put that on in on the Wednesday morning and when we come back up to church no way well, it's boiling uh, Talk about health and safety and the fire risk. I can't believe it. No wonder the bills in here are so high. But as, as we continue on, uh, mummification, we're, we're going to take a next step to mummification in the wonderful land of the Inca. Okay? And we've we got, we got some lots of images. And one thing that I can say about mummification in the land of the Inca is as follows. You know, back to the beginning when I, when I started talking about mummification, I started talking about your mum and dad, right? So what usually happens is that, um, uh, I don't know what the figures are, they seem to go up and down, but apparently 70% of our body is water, okay? Um, and as your body dries out, you're only left with 30% weight, agreed? Yeah, so um, you can think, and obviously everything shrivels out. So if you've got the person in a position um, that they're um, crouched, as in a crou crouched person like this sat down, yeah, uh, and then you, you wrap them, okay, lightly wrap them, and maybe with their face still showing, so you can still communicate with them and they can still hear you, okay, um, it would be the idea in Incan civilization to be able to carry that person with you everywhere. Um, and what we usually see um, is in the Incan world, say in the year 1500, um, people would go on long journeys to go from town to town to trade. There was a whole network of roads within the Incan world. And the interesting thing about this, they would have, uh, they would have every now and again, along these roads, they would have service stations, 500 years ago, right? Service stations that actually accommodated your needs, not buying a plate of chips at three in the morning that are all dry as anything, okay? These service stations within the Incan world were really practical. Because they also accommodated the mummies of your mum and dad. So there you go. You're back alive now, Brian. You decide to go on a journey. And you've got an alpaca with panniers on either side. Brian, I meant John. He looked at me strange then. So you're going, you're going from one spot to another. Um, and you're going from the way stations, as you call them. And you get to you get to one after after 15, 20 miles, and you actually want to stop for the night. So you knock the door, and there's a hostelier in there, okay? Also a guard, because they guarded these stations. And they would say, right, you want a bed for the night? Yeah. How many beds do you want for the night? I want one for me, and one for my mum and dad, and the panniers on the donkey. Okay, we can accommodate you and your mum but your dad's going to have to stay in the pannier on a donkey we're a bit full yeah and what, what would be, happen you would have a bed okay within this way station and in the niche in the wall okay you'd put your mum in the niche okay your dad would have to stay uh, with the alpaca in the shed next door you're going to get it in the head as you start to wander down the road, right? But that's exactly what Incan civilization did.
they accommodated the mummy and the person who's visiting these way stations. It's really, really important. You are joking, aren't you? Right, here we go. What I'm going to do now, uh, I'm going to... Uh, What I'm going to do, hang on, I'm still doing a bit of an overview, but what I want us to do is look at these ones. Has anyone ever heard of the Guauche mummies? No. There you go, the Guauche mummy, mummies. Now the Guauche mummies are these wonderful mummies from the Canary Islands. Can you see Yes. Among, among the archaeological findings made in Tenerife in the 1900s, one of the most striking is, without doubt, the discovery of the Guauche mummies in caves and crags on the island. The Guauche people would embalm their deceased and preserve them in caves that were difficult to access. It has been found that these used different mummifying techniques, which are believed to depend on the social rank uh, of the time or on the religious beliefs for the Guauche people of the Canary Islands. The process of embalming a body in the Guauche culture is similar to that of other ancient civilizations. Remember, this is on the Canary Islands, completely isolated. According to the research carried out in studying the Guauche mummies, these burials were used um, at least from about um, AD 200 until the conquest of the Canary Islands in the uh, middle of the fifth, uh, about the 1530s. A number of these mummies can currently be seen um, at the Museum of Nature and Mankind in Santa Cruz, um, Tenerife, which boasts one of the best systems for preserving such archaeological remains. However, very, very few Guanche mummies, in comparison with the number that existed actually survive. You've obviously been in the Tenerife Museum, yeah? I, I, no, I haven't. What I've been, I think, from Gomera, the island next to Tenerife. Yes. And I've been to Tenerife, 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 and I've Oh, right. That's why you know what you're yeah. Because the, the, the thing is, they, they, they just, they, they had not come across anything like the Spanish before. They had no way of dealing with them. That's right, well, that's what they did. That's yes. That was their reaction. Because they, they would have been enslaved otherwise. Yeah. Um, in, in, it said, and I love telling this fact, see so if we've got an image next. Got another image? Nope. We just we do have some other images, but keep with that one. Um, one very interesting fact is this: is when the when the conquistadors got to the island of the Canaries um, by about the mid 1500s, they were coming across tens of thousands of these mummies, as we described. Uh, the mummies themselves would be free of any liquids. They'd be very light, um, and they'd be very useful in medicine. And what's, what it said is that ships uh, would head towards the um, Canary Islands and fill up as ballast with thousands and thousands of these mummies. They would take them back to Europe. The mummies would be taken off the ships ground down into a, a powder with a pestle of water and apparently it's a well-known cure for stomach upsets. And it's said that um, if you go to a Chinese um, um, medicinal man with those little Chinese uh, medicinal shops that, you, that were a bit of a craze a few years ago in Britain, um, if you ever ask for something for a stomach upset, um, it's not in Britain, but I believe in 
China and Japan, the cure that they still used are the ground up remains of a human being. And apparently it will cure a stomach upset. How are we going to know about this uh, tea? We will go back down and now and see the tenor Is that what you're going to do? Yeah. All right then. Okay. <laughs> Again, I wanted to go back and forth to the different forms of mummification. Facts and forms of mummification in ancient Egypt. In the Dulux version, the brain was generally extracted down the nose and the entrails removed before the hollow body was dried out with salts. The process of mummification may take months, particularly um, if you've got somebody as important as a, a freshly deceased pharaoh. The way of removing the brain was to either um, insert a spoon um, through the ears or to insert a spoon through the nose, okay, or, or, or a spatula or something, and you'd chuck it up through the cavity and you'd move it around, you'd whisk it around, and then everything would drain out um, into a bucket, and then you would pour that into a canopic jar, and then that would be placed separately, and then you would um, slit the stomach open, and you would take um, from the ribs, um, ribs down to the stomach, you'd obviously take the tart out, that would go into one canopic jar, and then the other soft organs um, like the, li the liver, the kidney, and then all the guts would need to be taken out and all the rest of it. So th all those would be placed in uh, canopic jars of varying different sides, sizes. Um, and that's basically the extreme form of mummification where you take all those bits out. Um, I can never work out how the Egyptians um, felt that uh, somebody could come back to life with all their bits taken out, but that's what they believed. And look at this one here. What a very interesting fact. Uh, Egyptian mummies were mummified with hundreds of metres of linen and flax wrapping. Look at this one here. A mummy of Wa, an Egyptian estate manager, was wrapped in 375 metres of linen, approximately 2,000 years ago. What about this one? Uh, it's believed that the, that the Egyptians were the ones who finally cracked, cracked the art uh, in removing the inter internal organs um, before putre putrefaction actually begins. And the Egyptians, it said, are the best in the world at mummification. Deliberate mummification. I'm, I'm watching it, Michael, not putting extra milk in your cup. Your milk? Yes, please. At which point, we'll take a break. Are you, are you tired there, John? Cool. Can I ask why? I, I, why can I ask why I never get a chair in this room? I'm gonna nick one of those. Because you like. I, I always wonder why you never have a chair. Because you like stumping around. Yeah, because I want a chair today, and I want to be different. If I, hey, I can be different if I want to be. Can I, John? You can be different. What's that? There you go. Um, I actually wanted to start off. We've got a nice mummified head of a um, Chinchoro boy um, from the Americas. And Chinchoro boy dates to about 6,000 years ago. So again, it's, it's a very early form of mummy. Not in the normal states of mummification, as we described with those being found in Egypt, 
or those being found uh, wrapped and, and similarly mummified in the Canaries and South and Central America. But two things I want to share with you is something that I, I feel um, I was very touched by when I studied it some years ago. It was the people of Tuscany, known as the Etruscans, dating back around uh, 2,700 um, years ago, before the Romans, well before the Romans took over Italy. The Etruscans were really interesting people. Not so much mummifying their people, but in a way wishing to keep the memories of their loved ones and their place in the world alive. Now that links me very close to when we looked at the idea of living mummification. Where with the living mummy, we can argue whether it's suicide or not, but with the living mummy, it's somebody who wants to use their body as a carriage to what's next as part of the journey. And when we think particularly at the, about the Etruscans, um, is very much when somebody died in Etruscan civilization, the idea of death was abhorrent to the Etruscan. Their body was prepared, placed into a sarcophagi, sarcophagus, and then the sarcophagus was placed into a tomb under the ground. What's unusual about this? The tomb underground would completely replicate the person's home to every single detail. If the person had pots and pans on the wall, they would be carved into the stone. If the person was um, somebody who liked playing games, okay, the game ball would be carved into the stone. And everything else would be there to replicate the way the person lived. And what is very different from Egyptian mummification and very similar to the sense of mummification in South and Central American society um, five, six hundred years ago, where you would carry your loved ones around with you, what is very, very similar is that Etruscan tombs were always left open. And to me, what puts hairs up on the back of my neck is that the replication of the person is to be seen in stone, ivory, or wooden carvings down below. So the body would be in a sarcophagi underneath, said preserved, sometimes preserved and mummified. And then above, there would be a, a, a perfect replica of the person. We're talking about art. We're talking about carving so precise that they perfectly replicated the person. And we know that people visited their loved ones every single day. And how? Because the steps are basically inverted all the way down. And at the top of these, these wonderful underground tombs, there would be styles to stop the goats or the sheep getting in there, right? And the styles themselves would be sunken with the amount of wear of 200, 300 years worth of wear of somebody going down there. And there's a tomb turn great out in Italy. Exactly the same. You, they've got doors that just go in into the tombs so like little houses. Exactly. And this is it. That's, that's, that's come... Say, they're going in and out with flowers and... That, that's come from the idea of the Etruscans. That really has come from the sense and the idea of the Etruscans. And to me, that is immortalization. That person is remembered and kept alive in that spirit for two, three hundred years. And it may sound odd, but they deliberately had the people in poses. So a woman might, might have her arms out like this. She may be on a couch with her arms out like this. And then the daughter would say, Mum, that's your granddaughter there. And they would chat and communicate. And that puts up hairs on the back of my neck. Because these people are allowed to... Yeah. 
So, so, so the now deceased is is putting their child there, and it's just like, Mum, this is this is your granddaughter, your, your grand grandson, and it's just really, it, it's a very strange concept because in this society now we're just told to forget about people you know when they passed on just forget about them um and, and i i personally feel that that's really really wrong my granddad died in 2007 and i talk about him every single day and that was 10 years ago because i keep his memory alive i've got nowhere to i don't even know where he is right um uh, but he's in my mind and that that's this idea of mummification is about that Whatever way you want to look about it, look at it. I light candles to my mother every day. Yes, but these are different ways of mummification. It's in different ways of keeping these people with us, right? Exactly, me, everything, and trash I've got, guns. I've got a photograph of you. Exactly. Brand That's a form of mummification. Mm. Um, in Italy, and Ireland, and what, and Mexico, and some other countries in the world, um, very important monks. And priests were deliberately dried out. Putre, putrefaction, um, they, they, their organs were left in there and everything. Putrefaction would take place. They were dried out quite rapidly. So so they couldn't decay. And I've seen it. You'd, you'd have bodies in Italy, an island. You'd have, you'd have the priests and the monks. Um almost suspended from the walls so you could touch and rub their sandals, their feet, okay? People who have been there in these places for 100, 200, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 800 years and they're still there, okay? One of the biggest memories I've got of, of seeing a mummy, mummy, and we've really opened this out now, uh, is when I went to uh, the island of Zante, Zakynthos. And when I went to the island of Zante. Um, in Zante town, um, they, 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 they've got this cathedral type building. Can't remember exactly what it was. We went in there and, and you would queue to see um, the saint in the glass case, right? And looking through the glass case, you could see the saint that's been there for hundreds and hundreds of years. In this glass case, you could see the mummified. Okay? So, the idea of mummification, and that brings me back to when we talk about Alexander the Great. Mummification again. So there's a couple of area, other areas of mummification that I want to look at before we, we get to the end, and we'll look at a few other captions that, that link everything back together. The idea of uh, modern mummies and, and the Iceman. Um, and the d despicable things that have happened with with mummies. So we've got two little categories left there. But let's just have a little little look at a few more images uh, before we do those two things. Um, in some cases, the faces have been repainted several times and damage to the areas of the feet suggests they stood upright, perhaps as objects of veneration. That can be said with any mummies. Not just Egyptian mummies, but any mummies, okay? Um, going back to John, right? John in the room, right? Two and a half thousand, three thousand years ago. Callum Hallam, for example. Um, we've added bits to John as they fall off and the dog runs off with his fingers. Okay? He's been retouched up. Okay? John, John's head is still there. I put his arms ain't. Okay? But he's been retouched. And, and there's an important point about this. There's a very important point about this. And I touched upon it, but I didn't complete it. The point was, was this. Um, the reason at Callum Hallam why we're only keeping John, right? We've got one or two other family members, but we thought, right, as everyone passes on, we're going to have a complete building just full of our loved ones, and we're not going to live anywhere, right? So we'll add one person passes on, but we'll keep one one of their body parts, right? That person lives on on John's body, okay? Um... You could be really crude here, and you know I want to be crude, but I'm not going to be, okay? Uh, Brian knows what I'm talking about. Um, but what, what, what we've got there is we're remembering everybody through John, okay? So after, after 60 years, right, John has the body parts of 10 people on him, okay? Um, and all of those are remembered through John's body, 
We've still got John's head, but nothing else, right? The ribs and stuff, but that's what's going on. So we've retouched it, we've added to it because it's become damaged. Really important. And we're seeing this in, in the archaeology. Um, there's another one of the Guauche mummies. Um, it's, a, it's a massive shame about the Guauche mummies that we, that we don't have as many left on the planet as we should do. Uh, here we go. The majority of European and North American mummies were created by completely natural means. What do we do? What do we mean by that? Oh, bugger. It, it's in there already, okay? What, what I mean by that is Otzi the Iceman, okay? Can you all remember watching I, Otzi the Iceman being found two decades ago, over two decades ago, in the, in the Italian, Austrian, T Tyrol, sort of the, the Alps, yeah? And then basically, what, what it showed is that uh, there was a couple of uh, walkers out, rambling there, with their ice picks, and they thought it was a modern body, right? So there they are, picking the thing out of the ice, right? Um, and the massive gash in Otzi's, Otzi's side, right? They thought this person was, was somebody who had just died a couple of weeks ago, right? Terrible way to treat a body, that. And then... They, they brought a rescue team up there and the rescue team suddenly realised that um, people don't wear shoes. Um, bows and arrows. Yeah, bows and arrows. They don't wear, well, they don't wear shoes made out of, um, that have been weaved together, right? Um, you know, they don't wear them together. They don't have bows and arrows, right? And then suddenly they realised that Otzi wasn't two years old or a week old. He was thousands of years old. And he'd be naturally mummified, right? And what we mean by natural means is that he went out there to either hide, he was overtaken by the cold, right? He didn't commit suicide. He wasn't mummified deliberately by somebody. He was accidentally mummified. And he shot. Yeah, and an arrow. Eventually, they found that, that, that an arrow had pierced him um, either through well either through the back or the front, but it was it was in the top part of the body, right? Can't remember exactly where, but they found a little arrow buried in him. So he'd gone off, and he'd it, it got he got weaker and weaker and weaker. We we, we learned a lot from Otzi, but that's archaeology. What I'm talking about is mummy specifically. So that's natural mummification. And today, now, as the ice is melting in parts of the Alps, um, they're actually finding hundreds of people who'd fought in the First World War in. Their full uniforms, holding their firearms. Some of these people died on duty, okay? And they just they just fell over the precipice into the ice, and that's it. And now they're melting out because the way the way ice works is that it takes the stuff it, it takes the stuff from the bottom and brings it back to the surface, and it recycles it, brings it back. Okay. Sometimes you get complete examples. Other times you have a, an arm or a leg. Or something like that. Okay? <clears throat> and there, there she is, a Peruvian male mummy uh, wearing a textile headband. Okay? Are you okay, John? Good. Oh, well, oh, oh, another ten minutes, John, all right? I, I, know, I know you're missing. Just saying, where are you? Come on, he's kept you longer today. Good. All right, fair enough. I, I, I want us to um, I want us to look at what's going on in Peru and Central America. And what's going on in Peru and Central America today is quite despicable. And why is it despicable? Well, um, what we're finding is that there are cemeteries with with hundreds and thousands of burials, all have been mummified. You, usually what they're doing, they're, they're, they're crouched and they're bound up in one wrapping together, okay? Not, it, not all the arms and everything individually wrapped, they're all bound up together. They're usually placed into a wicker basket in the ground and they're buried with wonderful textiles and some buried with jewellery and all the rest of it. And the terrible thing is what's happening is that um, the most value on these, on these bodies is actually the head Okay, so what's happening is these bodies are being dug up, right, being taken onto the surface, the wrapping's being ripped open, any textiles they can take off the body, they're taken off, this is now, today, um, any 
precious items, and then they're taking the head away, and then the rest of it's left there. Like they're burying young girls up in the We'll do that in a minute. Oh, do that in a minute. Do that in a minute. <coughs> the, the point, I'm talking about what's happening to some of these, these bodies. Um, and that's an even different angle to go off on. But anyway, the terrible thing is, is that the deprived way these skeletal remains are being treated is that they're, they're taking a head away and everything else and they're just leaving the rest of the body there because the head itself, um, the people retrieving these heads are getting two, three hundred pounds a time. So you can imagine, uh, you, dig up, you dig up 50 of these a year, um, you're earning as much as somebody um, in Europe Okay, um, and that's a lot of money, and it, there's there's a big um, there's a big market in it. There are people in America now who've got whole living rooms just with heads. It's mainly in America people are buying this stuff. Maybe some people in Germany, uh, some people in other parts of Europe, but it's mainly in America. And, and and to me that that's quite sick. Okay. You, you mentioned, uh, it's, a, it's a good link with, with this one, a Peruvian uh, male mummy uh, wearing a textile headband. If you want to look at something like this, okay, it does look quite feminine actually. Um, if you want to think of another form of mummification, um, and we haven't done Lindo Man or anything yet, but we will before the end. Um, what used to happen in, in Incan civilization that a girl would be chosen to appease the gods or a boy would be chosen to appease the gods and they they it said would compete for the honour to be sacrificed and it was quite an honour to become a mummy okay so the child would be taken on a journey to the place of the gods which would be high up in the mountains. Um, and over that journey, the girl would be, or the boy, would be given um, psychotropic drugs. They may mumble and they may speak voices of the gods. Uh, and then, slowly but surely, they would be poisoned. They would be poisoned in such a way that it was comfortable for them. Um, and then... There would be the moment that they would sit down as high as a kite and they would be bludgeoned on the back of the neck and then they would be mummified. Some of them may still be conscious when all this is being undertaken but then they were in areas where the conditions were so cold that they would be numbed, they would go into hypothermia and they would die anyway. Apparently I'm told when you go into hypothermia you don't feel anything anyway. Um, and then they would be mummified and left there. You could say that that's murder. If we could have another debate here, Brian. We could say that that's murder. Um, but it's what society did. It was acceptable. And the girls and the boys would compete to be the chosen ones. Is that suicide? Is that murder? If, if, if you come to me in a room, Brian, I say... I say, right, Carl, I want, I want you to give you the honour of, of you killing me, right? We're filming all this, and I kill you, right? In court, the, the jury would argue whether that was murder, manslaughter, or something else. And the, diff, the thing is, it's something else, which we cannot define in, in this modern day and age. That came at the right time there, uh, uh, Michael. Uh, human remains were once the very last thing archaeologists were concerned with in their haste to reach the grave goods. Now that takes me into another angle. Don't let me forget the bog bodies, because we've got to do them before we end. Uh, this takes me on another journey. Um, in Egypt, not only are thousands and thousands of bodies coming over to Europe in the um, 1800s, in the 1900s, they had another problem. The bodies were no longer going to Europe, really. And there were stacks of mummy, mummified remains. Not only human mummified remains, but...
for remains of ibis birds, crocodiles, you name it, it was there. And there's a description, which I can't remember uh, what year, but it was in Cairo. And the description is, is that the power station in Cairo needed fuel. For some strange reason, then run out of fuel. And somebody said, look, down the road, there's a cache of millions of ibis birds, all mummified. And they burnt the lot as fuel. Can you imagine that? They burnt all these ibis birds as fuel. And they would have chucked a, chucked a few human remains in there as well. Um, and, and to me, uh, looking as an archaeologist, I slowly start to think, is why did we just leave lots of these bodies to rest? Why do we need to dig them up all the time? I, I, I'm, not, I, I'm not somebody who agrees with digging up human remains. I think if somebody's taken out of the ground, they should be left there. If their body needs to be taken out of the ground, um, then they need to be reburied and treated with, with respect. Um, when something like that happens, where you're just burning them for fuel, you start to think, and the grouchy mummies all ground down for to um, cure an upset stomach and all these other things, it, it starts to make you wonder what humanity is about. There you go, a grouchy mummy there, really, really well preserved. We could have learned so much about the grouchy mummies. There's descriptions that they look very caucus eyed like, that they were tall. There's descriptions that they had blonde hair and all these other things. They were certainly very different from uh, Europeans and Africans, but more closer to Europeans than anything. Uh, there you go. That's one of the mummies on display there um, in in San Andreas, which is, um, I don't know what island that's in, in Ten um, Canaries, but I'm sure Brian could tell us. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, this, this, is, this is one thing. This is the step. If you can play the head level when you're happy, you might win it next week. I think it's the rats. That's the queen. Anyway, here we go. Mummification, step by step. Um, I, I'm going to sit and talk this one, actually. Ancient Egyptians believed in an afterlife. When someone died, mummification helped someone reach the afterlife as they thought that in order to have an afterlife, the dead person would have to repossess his or her body. But, I, but as I said to uh, John earlier on, um, if every, all the organs are taken out, the brain and the heart... Um, Egyptians believed that the only way to do this was if the body was recognisable on the outside. Mummification was mainly done to wealthy people, as poorer people could not afford the process. The chief in Bama was a priest wearing a mask of Anubis. So that, that, that's Anubis there, so you might wear a mask like that. Anubis was the jackal-headed god of the dead. He was closely associated with mummification and embalming. Hence, priests wore a mask of Anubis. This is a step-by-step -step process of how mummification took place. One, we've done some of this already. Insert a hook through a hole near the nose and pull out part of the brain or through the ears. Make a cut on the left side of the body near the tummy. Remove all internal organs. Let the internal organs dry. Place the lungs, intestines, uh, stomach and liver inside canopic jars. Some were placed back into the body, like the heart. Rinse in, but before you do, do replace some of these organs back in there. Rinse inside the body with wine and spices. Cover the corpse with natron salt for 70 days. As I said, this is a three month process. After 40 days, stuff the body with linen or sand to give it, it, it a more human shape. After a 70-day wrap, the body from head to toe in bandages. Place in a sarcophagus, a type of box-like coffin. If the person had been a pharaoh, he would pla be placed inside a special burial chamber with lots of treasure. 
that is um, by far when we started looking at um, what mummification is in the normal concept would be. But we've talked about loads of different areas of mummification. So what we're going to do now, I'm just going to flick back over, um, see if I can get, here we go. Don't worry, your eyes are going to go a bit strange. I thought I did actually have an image of one of our bog bodies in this country. Uh, that That is somebody from Peru. Oh God, what's going on? Unfortunately, I don't have an image here, but so uh, we'll, we'll, We'll do it on the back of that one there, there anyway. Um, so, in this country, um, we've got another form of mummification. And we talked about Callum Hallam uh, from South Uist and the Hebridean Islands of Scotland. Um, but the other areas of uh, mummification can be seen in our bog bodies. Um, and the basic bog bodies in Britain and Denmark and northern Germany are to be seen as those individuals that have been sacrificed to the gods 2,500 years ago or thereabouts. And the way to really look at this is somebody may have volunteered their services to be sacrificed. Some used to say it was a criminal. Some used to say um, it was somebody that was outside society. Whoever these people were, um, they either went willingly and if they didn't go willingly, they must have been under some kind of influence. And usually there would be a peat bog involved. And if it's a sacrifice to some kind of god, uh, the individual would in the morning, it said, eat some kind of porridge. Um, and that porridge would be heavily drugged. So... Then that individual was taken to the area of the bog, maybe dressed up in finery, may have had a cap placed onto their head, with some examples of the bog bodies. And then the individual would have been ceremonially stabbed. Okay, don't worry, John, we're not going to do that to you. You're next, Brian. Would have been ceremonially stabbed. And then the person would start to bleed. Stabbing would usually take place in the chest area. But you could not stab the individual so that they died straight away. They'd be high on drugs anyway, so they're probably not feeling any of this. And then, the individual would be bludgeoned on the back of the neck. So we would knock them out. And then, after they're under the influence, and with a mind, with the fairies, they would be um, ceremonially hung. Okay? They would be garroted by force, usually placed face down. So if by any chance they should wake up from all this, they would drown in their own blood. And then the bog would take them, and 2,000 years later, Pete Marsh and Lindo Man would reveal their secrets. And we've got examples of bog bodies in Ireland as well. That's a nice end. Are there any questions? No? Okay. Hopefully Martin will be back next week. Maybe Steve and maybe Linda. So next week, uh, the topic that will be covered next week uh, we'll be looking at, um, I do believe, the uh, a Roman villa um, and the Roman villas of Wales um, and some Roman villas of England. So that'll be a bit of an overview. So we're doing the Romans next week. If there's no other questions, okay. Um, thank you very much. Have you all enjoyed it tonight? Yeah. Today? This is the May Bank holiday. You will be doing it too. Mm. Oh, don't tell me it's a made back holiday next yeah, week. No We've got another holiday. Yeah. I think yeah. so. It's called My Day Monday, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, no, it's not Monday the 30th. It's no, going to be... No, right, sorry. Monday the 7th. But we've got another stupid bank holiday coming up. Oh, my God. Children of school again. Uh, 
If there's, uh, if there's no more questions, thank you very much. I'll see you all next week. Yeah. Well, I'm going to see you next week. I'll be here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you.